Americans are capable of achieving extraordinary things when they have the freedom and opportunity to do so. This is American Potential, and here's your host, Jeff Crank. All right, well, welcome to another edition of American Potential. Thanks for being with us, and thanks for joining us. The success of the podcast is growing. It's incredible. Our, our direct downloads are, are going through the roof. And our views on Facebook and YouTube, a lot of people watching the podcast now on YouTube. And we've got a great topic for you today. You know, to be considered for most jobs, you have to have a degree or a license showing you have an understanding of the profession. And with certain licenses, the state you live in determines how many hours of training are required to gain that license. And this is true for things like being a realtor, being a, a, a nail technician, or a barber. Why is this important? Simple. It creates a government-imposed barrier to success. And there are many people in poverty in America who have great ca- talent to cut hair. But because government requires thousands of hours of training, success is out of reach for so many people who could have success Otherwise, and again, because the government erected these barriers. And when it comes to cutting hair, the average number of hours required in most states is around 1,500 hours. And in Iowa, they just lowered the number of required hours from 2,100 hours to 1,500 hours. So, how does this change affect people pursuing a license in Iowa? And how do salon owners feel about it? On today's podcast, we have a father and daughter whose family owns and operates multiple Great Clip salons in Iowa and Nebraska. And they were a part of getting these hours reduced. And I want to welcome Sam Regis and Jerry Akers to the show. Sam, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, Jerry, thanks for joining us. It's been a pleasure. We're going to enjoy talking to you about this subject, Jeff. Okay. Now, listen, first thing I I hear, Monica tells me that Sam shares her wedding anniversary, which is July 3rd, happy anniversary a couple weeks ago, with your parents, your grandparents, and your great grandparents. You all get married on the day before Independence Day. It's excellent. We followed up with a holiday, so people have all the time (laughs) off to celebrate. That's really well, cool. Was this something planned, Jerry? For me, it was planned. Well, you know, my wife would like to be married on a day that means something to her family. But for me, many husbands forget their wedding anniversary date. This makes uh-huh. it much less likely I'll forget it the day before the 4th <laughs> of July. You're smart thinking, Jerry. That, that was pretty good. But how about your your parents and your grandparents? Same thing? Same my day? mom's parents and grandparents. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that's incredible. Well, that's kind of a neat, kind of a neat tradition. Um, that that's pretty neat. So Well, we, we get the chance to celebrate together. And again, it's on the fourth of July. So many times we're celebrating a long weekend. So it turns into a monster celebration instead of a another ho hum wedding anniversary celebration. Yeah. Well that that is that's that's neat. And look, I'm really excited about this. What a what a great success story. First I want to talk about your business. How many great clip salons do you all own? How did you get into the franchise? And and I'd love to hear your story about how you built this business, Jerry. All right. Thank you. Sam's anxious. She's in the starting blocks ready to tell you stories. So I'm (laughs) I'm glad you called my name. So I had a chance before she got in, you know, um, so I was in corporate America, like many people, and we were doing investments in real estate and a variety of other things. And I was, I was actually coaching. I was doing business consulting, coaching a business broker who uh, I helped him with some businesses, improving them so he could resell them and so on. And uh, he came to me and asked if I'd be interested in owning another business. Uh, I said, yes. Uh, we ended up with one great clips. That's all we wanted was one just to subsidize our retirement. And we turned it around in a very short order. We doubled the revenues coming through that one underperforming location. Uh, we had the opportunity to buy four more, did the same thing with that. And then we decided that we were onto something. So we set out on a journey without a real goal in mind, just to continue to grow. And we've built some organically and acquired others. 
Uh, we got up as high as 38, I think, at one time. Uh, about in 2008, I believe it was. Now, Sam might correct me here in a minute. 2010, uh, she came into the business, and uh, she, uh, you know, started a path to help um, kind of modernize our business and give us some capabilities that uh, we didn't have before. I'm not a tech guy, and I'm also not in the age group with most of our stylists, so she has both of those things going on. Shortly thereafter, her sister uh, graduated from college, came on board. And at this time now, post-COVID, Sam and her sister and uh, my son-in-law basically run the company. So that's the short answer to that question. Wow, that's that's amazing. Um, I, I'd love to kind of know, Sam, too, through COVID, I'm sure was a very difficult time for hairstylists and barber shops and things like that. I can't imagine how difficult that was to get through, particularly when you own the numbers of, uh, of, of salons that you all own. Tell us about that. Yeah. So we had actually purchased 10 salons, not terribly long before the pandemic. So right. that was Ti- a timing whole... is everything. Timing yeah. is everything. <laughs> <laughs> we actually we were <laughs> celebrating a, we did a company party. It was one year in, we did a company party with our 10 most recently purchased salons. And that was the weekend that things started shutting down. In fact, that morning we had to have a conversation with our corporate office to decide, are we still having this event or not? Um, so we we ended up having that event. The event for our original 17 salons had to be canceled because of COVID. Um, and then we shipped mom and dad off to the lake house to keep them safe. Nobody knew what was going on at the time. And my sister, brother-in-law, and I sat around our conference table. All of us, our salons were shut down by state mandates And um, for I think it was maybe eight weeks or so. And we sat at a conference table and just scratched our head every day watching, you know, conference calls with uh, the governors and all of that, just trying to figure out how do we stay alive after this? How do we survive? How do we get our staff back? How do we keep them safe when we come back? It was crazy, but it was great to be a family business at that time because we could still go to the office and put our heads together in person with my sister, brother-in-law and I, and um, somehow we, we came through it. Uh, and then of course, timing again, we decided we'd buy nine more salons a year after the pandemic was going on, because why wouldn't we do that? That makes <laughs> sure. total sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. Now I feel like I can ask this because I already see the interaction between father and daughter here, but <laughs> Sam, you have to tell me what's the best and worst thing about working with your dad. (laughs) You know, I would say the best thing is that my dad and I are very much alike. And so we can really compliment each other when we are working on projects together. Or my favorite thing, years ago, we would do training together and we could just banter almost back and forth and have a great time doing that. And I would say, you know, now I do all the training, but I learned all of the things that I know on training from him, which was great. One of the worst things I would say, and you'll hear from other next generation business owners, the same thing is that when you're in a family business, sometimes you aren't sure if the generation one is in or out like any day it could flip. Uh, and so there are times where we'll make a decision about something that we thought they didn't care about anymore. And then all of a sudden we'll find out, oh, they wanted to know about that ahead of time or, oh, they wanted to have a say in that or something. So it's, you know, with time, things continue to move forward and that's changing a little bit now for sure. But um, that's one of the hardest things I would say. All right. Now, I don't want this to become a family therapy session or I'd have to charge you. <laughs> But, Jerry, I'm going to give you a a moment to rebut. Oh, yeah. Well, absolutely the best thing, uh, (laughs) both with Sam and her sister and even our son-in-law, is the the pride and so on that goes with being able to hand off our baby, something that we built with our sweat and, you know, risk and all those kinds of things, and know that it's going to not only uh, survive but thrive under new ownership. So that is absolutely the best thing, knowing that, they're taking the things we trained them on as well as things they brought uh, from their other life to to make it better. And and the worst thing really is for me, worrying fairly often as to what they're thinking about this, just like Sam just mentioned, you know, should I step in? Should I stay out? Did, was that comment taken correctly? Those kinds of things, because really at this point in time, my wife and I are pretty much out of it. Um, 
you know, we still have oversight and so on, but it is it is a, a tenuous situation some days for a very short period of time when we're trying to figure out some of the moving pieces. So there you go, Jeff. Well, no, and I appreciate that. And you know what? Just I think anybody watching or listening to this podcast can tell right away uh, that you're a very close, you know, there's a close relationship between the two of you. And, you know, that's something that I think a lot of family businesses don't understand. There, There's a lot of maybe tension throughout, you know, doing business with anybody in your family, but it also builds bonds that maybe other families don't have the opportunity to build. So that's great. And I think people can tell just by seeing the interaction that, that you two like each other. Let's put it that well, way. We, we get along pretty well. And I'll just interject <laughs> something quick and turn it back to you. But one of the most prideful things in my life is my two daughters are looked at by 700 or 800 other franchisees in our system, as well as others through our involvement in IFA and NFIB and things like that as being rock stars. And at their age, to have people my age who didn't know them before their interaction in business, uh, looking up to them, uh, taking advice from them, taking tools that we've built or that they've built and using them in their business. I mean, I just can't describe how proud that makes a father uh, to know that, you know, maybe you did something right along the way and they've turned out okay. And it's not just you being prideful looking at that. It's others telling you that. Yeah. No, I think that's right. That's right. Jerry, let me ask you, how did Iowa, let's talk about this licensing issue. How did Iowa compare to other states? We see this across the uh, United States a lot of times. And and these hours, these licensing hours that are used, a lot of times are become a barrier for success mm. for, for the average citizen. And it's it's used by people in the industry to keep out competition, right? Yeah. And, and 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 that's you see that state after state. But how did Iowa compare to other states when it came to how many hours were required? Well, you mentioned it in the opening. It was onerous. It was it was unbelievably burdensome for populations that can't afford to have that kind of a burden. So twenty one hundred hours was the highest. I think there was one other state that was around twenty one hundred hours in the United States, and it was just ridiculous. I worked eight years on this, talking to people in uh, our state capital trying to work through the system. Uh, and it was it was terrible. We hear stories from stylists who uh, couldn't couldn't pay their rent because they had to make the student loan payment. And so in Iowa, you know, the schools are charging about twenty to twenty three thousand dollars for the license itself, for the education. But what's missed in that is those people are going to school pretty much full time. So they've got to pay living expenses during that period of time too. So you can almost double the amount of money that they're going in debt. So they may end up with thirty or forty thousand dollars in debt that they're going to carry for twenty or thirty years trying to pay it down, and it is unnecessary. You know, when hairstyling and many under other industries started, you learned it. You learned the skill under the tutelage of somebody that had been doing it for a few years, and it was basically free. Maybe even got paid a little bit while you were going along, and then the school systems got involved and student loans and all that kind of stuff, and it turned into a business. So now. You know, we've gone from one end of the spectrum to the other. Now we're trying to get them closer to the middle. And it has been fighting tooth and nail. In fact, you know, we went after a thousand hours, to be very honest with you, Jeff, and we ended up at 15 or 1600 wherever they, they stop. Um, I really believe we need to be at a thousand hours to make this work. Uh, but it's got to continue to change not only in our business or industry, but in many of them because. You know, many of our employees come from multi-generation poverty and we give them, we're the bright shining beacon of how to break out of that and get a single mom, you know, above board, maybe buy our first house in multiple generations. And this is just a, a cross around their neck that is tough to bear. So we'll keep fighting the battle. Yeah, it is. It's difficult. And again, I refer to it as a government imposed barrier. It's something we talk about on this podcast a lot, but government has a way of doing that. and. You know, it's it's you've got people who are trying to succeed. We've seen this. We've seen hair braiding requirements in some states. We see uh, these these sorts of licensing requirements. And I'm not suggesting that it should there shouldn't be any kind of requirement. Right. But boy, it should be as minimal as necessary. It would seem uh, to 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 do that. Sam, let me ask you. You you have a, you all have a kind of a unique perspective because you own salons in two states that have two different hour requirements. In Nebraska, it's only 1,800 hours, or what was only 1,800 hours 
required, but in Iowa is twenty one hundred. So uh, now you're now Iowa is a little bit better. Could you all see a difference in the skills of students coming out of Iowa compared to Nebraska, or did that training not have any any difference in uh, those two states? No, we didn't see a change in the skill level. So one of the things that as I talk with my managers, I don't cut hair, um, but I've watched the magic that they do for a lot of years now. And um, I feel for my managers when they are out there working hard to try and train someone as they get out of school to cut hair in a salon. It's it's not the same, right? I mean, if you think about it, when you're in college and you're writing a paper, that's not what your job is going to look like when you get out, right? So it, we need the schools. We need them to teach them the basics, but then we kind of need them to be able to learn on the floor, as dad was mentioning. So between Iowa and Nebraska, in both cases, regardless of the amount of hours that people were coming out of school, we were teaching them a lot of what they need to know about cutting hair once they're in the salon. Now, the schools teach them the basics. We need that, right? Like we all need kindergarten to teach us the ABCs or we can't right. read, write, talk, any of those things, right? That's what we need from the schools. A lot of times what we see is that the schools fill in a lot of extra stuff that isn't going to help them be better or more prepared, I suppose, for their jobs in the industry, their careers, hopefully, the way they see it. Right. Now, Sam, uh, I'll ask you first, and Jerry, if you want to follow up, that'd be fine, too. Um, as as you look at this, what, what about other areas? Like, what is it, how many hours would it require to be an EMT in Iowa or, you know, some of these <laughs> other licenses? I mean, it would seem that it, cutting hair probably there were many more hours required of hairstylists than there were of some of these other areas. Uh, can you speak to that, Sam? Absolutely. So my husband is actually a licensed EMR, which is barely a step below an EMT. He's a volunteer mm -hmm. firefighter and EM, EMR. And, uh, you know, as he was going through school, he would go to those classes evenings after his full-time job for several weeks and then take a test and he's licensed and he's out there first on scene wow. trying to help keep people alive. Right. right. Um, I forget the exact number, but I believe that it was somewhere below 200 hours mm -hmm. to get his EMR license, which is crazy to me because when it comes to cutting hair, theoretically, we don't have any lives that we have to worry right. about. Right? right. I mean, we have to make sure that the stylists understand sanitations and keeping things clean and safe for the, you know, the community around them. Obviously, we need to make sure of that. We've got to make sure they know how to cut the hair and make it look nice for all of us that are in, you know, getting our hair cut. But they're not saving lives. And they're spending all of this time, as dad was saying, being out of the work industry just to get this license. Yeah, that's crazy. Jerry, you're, you have any thoughts on that? Well, Sam mimicked many of the things I've been saying over the years, so she didn't leave me much to talk about. But I believe 134, 144 right in that range is what an EMT, first level EMT, has to have in Iowa. And every time we have this discussion at a higher level, like in, in the state capitol or something, they say, oh, but that's just the entry level. The next level is like 600. And I'm like, it's 2100 for hairstyling, folks. <laughs> Nobody's going to die from a bad haircut. So right. let's get this. Let's get real about this. And, and frankly, knowing that the guy that's saving my life after a car accident only has 144 doesn't necessarily make me real comfortable either. <laughs> right. So maybe we ought to have a few more there and a few less on hairstyling, <laughs> you know. But but yeah, it's when you dig into the basics of this, it is simply ridiculous. Uh, we have talked internally about starting an apprenticeship system through our salons to uh, bring kids in straight out of high school because I know Many of the underserved communities are not choosing to go into this industry, to your point, Jeff, because they learn of the cost and, you know, going into debt and the time commitment and things like that. And they're just not going to move forward with that. With an apprenticeship, we'd have a chance to, you know, keep their cost to nothing, basically, and even give them a small wage while they're going through it. And my bet is, since it's all hours related, even though we would be governed by a 1500 hour uh, mandate. We can do it way faster and way more efficiently than a school can do. So, um, again, the, the hours thing makes zero sense. So we'll keep fighting the battle. Yeah, it, it, it's such such a barrier that's put in front of people that, again, that's who, what we have to think about are these 
these people that are just trying to either claw their way out of poverty, make a make a living, make a life for themselves, pay to put groceries, uh, you know, in the kitchen cupboards. It it just is crazy that these are these are government. And again, the old saying, right? I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you. Uh, these requirements when you're ju- you're trying to help enable people, hire them as employees, give them a a, a nice wage so that they can. They can, uh, you know, take care of their families, but government is in the way with with silly requirements like this. Jeff, can I jump on that? For yeah, just a second? sure. Because we know a number of students that have gone into school and over the time they've missed school. Right. I mean, we all miss things. Right. When it comes to being in any university, college, whatever. Um, but they miss school. Well, that's understandable. They have to make those hours up. That's fine. But they get to the point where life happens. They have to miss for various things or even a job so they can pay their bills. And then they end up owing back so much extra to the schooling, having nothing to do with their financial aid or any of that, owing back to the school because they've been in school for too long, so to speak. So the schools have a a system set up so that they allot a certain amount of time for a student, right? If a student misses hours in that time, They have to make them up. But the way the school sees it is now they're going to be in it longer and they're going to almost own own double. Right. In some cases. And so we see a lot of people drop out of the industry altogether um, before they've even graduated, before they've even gotten licensed. They just stop altogether because they can't be away from their lives that long. Mm -hmm. So I, I have stories from my own staff who have thought, gosh, I could have been in. I could have been in a salon so much sooner. What do you mean? I I don't understand who who's going to, you know, help me out now because I did all those extra hours and I missed all of that extra time. It is kind of how it goes, but we're excited that our staff are helping us to make things better for the industry because that's the goal is to just make things better for the industry, whether it's Nebraskans, Iowans, it doesn't really matter. We want to make things better for those out there working. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jerry, tell me, how did you find out about this bill in the legislature that changed the requirements? <laughs> well, after eight years of beating a lot of people up in in uh, Des Moines, uh, I'm pretty well known down there related to this kind of a, an effort. So I heard from, uh, I, you know, I've got a, a I'm on the uh, leadership council for the NFIB of Iowa. So they track it. They would let me know. Uh, certainly there's a couple lobbyists down there that I've worked with in the past that reached out to me and said, Hey, this is going on. And then, uh, we actually had a guy for, uh, uh, I forgot his name now, but a gentleman from Americans for prosperity that reached out to me and said, uh, we we've heard what you've been doing down here. We'd really like to have you be able to speak out on this. We'll help facilitate it and introduce you and so on. So that's really how that path, uh, you know, went forward. And a quick story about that. This is how committed we are. My (laughs) wife and I had taken off to drive to our lake house, which is in northern Arkansas in this past winter. And we had gotten as far as Branson, which is only an hour from our lake house. And uh, they had an ice storm. So we stayed in a hotel. And I had barely settled in the hotel when I got a text message saying, tomorrow, there's going to be a a testimony, a hearing uh, (laughs) in Des Moines on this. And we really need you there. So I got my wife settled in and I packed up again, turned around and drove uh, seven hours back to Des Moines and got another hotel so I could get up the next morning and be there to do this. But this is this is what we live for right now, Jeff. Yeah, well, that's that's incredible that uh, that uh, great timing. We, As I said earlier, timing is everything, right? It sounds like whether you're testifying on a bill or buying uh, salons right before covid uh, Sam, you, you testified as well. What were some of the stories you shared with the committee? Yeah, so I was thankful, again, that my staff was <laughs> to help with this process. So I was able to share stories with the committee about staff who, you know, when they were in school, once they got done with all of their classes and it was just a matter of waiting for customers to come in, they would be paying the school for their hours while they were sitting in the break room of the school scrolling on their phones. Because they had to wait for customers so that they could get credit for doing those haircuts or doing those services. You know, I, I, I told a few stories about people who maybe weren't actually in the break room uh, during those waiting times. Because if they weren't there and nobody knew that they weren't there, they would still be getting their hours for school again still paying the school for that time. But they were able to get hours that way. We talked about um, some schools who, don't get me wrong, I love fun. But some schools who spent 
the kids in school or the students in school spent time going to pumpkin patches or doing Halloween makeup. Again, makeup is part of the the license, you know, a cosmetology license. There's a portion that's about makeup, but spending time getting hours doing those things when they were paying the school for those things. And then many of them aren't going to use that uh, when they get out of school. So, you know, we were able to tell stories about, again, I mentioned these earlier, but students who considered dropping out of school, who did drop out of school, who had to get back into school, who transferred from one state to another, even we had some that were, you know, get bouncing back and forth between Iowa and Nebraska. If they lived close to the line, they would work in Iowa or in Nebraska and go to school in Nebraska instead of staying in the state they lived in because mm. they could. Um, it's it just it's crazy to me. But I did want to jump back for a second. Tyler is the name of the lobbyist that got sure. us into this. He was excellent. He was so much fun Um, when dad was actually unable to go and testify on a similar bill uh, on the other side of the house. We uh, we actually uh, I worked with Tyler directly and him and I worked on that one, too. So it was it was a pretty good time. But Tyler was very um, informative. He was able to help us understand what was going on, get us all the details and get us in touch with the people we needed to. And I think that's what we need out of our lobbyists. Right. Is, Is people that are willing to make connections with those out here in. I don't know, the real world, so to yeah. speak, or or the industry, I guess. Yeah. Well, and Tyler with Americans for Prosperity, he's the one we brought the story on this podcast about William Burt and the mobile barber shops in yes. Iowa. And I know right. Tyler was involved with that uh, that effort as well. Let me let me ask you, as you were testifying on this, clearly you met some resistance because you wanted the it to be a thousand hours, you ended up at fifteen hundred. What what is the resistance to this? Who where does that come from? Who is opposed to reducing the number of hours required? Well, I'll jump quickly on that one because okay. I saw it firsthand in one yeah. of them that I testified on when Dad was unavailable. Um, the schools are not excited about it. Um, in a lot gotcha. of cases, we see schools who are concerned about um, the amount of money that they will be bringing in if their students are there you know, for less amount of time. Um, Our theory is they could have more students get in, you know, because they're getting them through quicker. Uh, Mm -hmm. But a lot of times we'll see changes within the school system that um, aren't in favor of lowering those hours. And one of the things specifically that happened when I was testifying was uh, one of the schools mentioned that keeping the hours where they were meant that we were able to modernize the industry by training on some of these additional techniques and so on. And my theory was, how are we modernizing the industry if we're keeping the hours significantly higher than what they were back then? And yet I still have to teach them how to cut hair when they get done with school. That doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't sound like any modernization that I'm familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's incredible that I would have thought that it would have been operators like you who wanted to protect, you know, their, not their monopoly, but, but just lower the, uh, the the amount of competitors coming into the market but it sounds like it's the education establishment the people teaching these classes that that were most uh opposed to this um that that's interesting it um, is and i think for good reason right they're concerned about the you know community around them and those kinds of things again that safety piece but how long do we need to teach somebody about you know the safety of how to clean their tools I mean, that's my that's my concern. Right. And I understand we have to do those things, which is why I say I don't want anybody to get it twisted. The schools are important to us. We need them. In fact, we work hard to have great relationships with them. We absolutely need them to survive in this industry because there's some training that needs to continue. But we also need to make sure that their goal is to help improve the industry for those in the industry. Right. That's where I think we're missing something. Yeah. Well, as we wrap up, uh, do you all have, and I guess I'll put this to Jerry first and Sam, anything you might add as well, but do you all plan to be involved in getting any other laws passed now that, now that you've gotten this one done, what's next for you? Well, first off, we we need to keep fighting this fight, Jeff. We need to, we need to get those hours down significantly below where they're at. I think, I think a thousand hours should be the maximum. I think it actually could be in the 700 range because to Sam's point, you know, they need to they need to learn the basics. And everybody in the industry knows these kids are coming out of school not knowing how to do the services. 
and not knowing the things that they need to do to be successful. It's not the schools don't try, but a variety of things happen. So we've got to, we've got to, if we're going to be coaching them and training them anyhow, let's cut the investment they put in up front, get them the basics for, you know, $5,000 instead of $20,000 plus living expenses, and then get them back out and let us do our thing, which we're already doing. We'll just do it to a higher degree. So we're going to continue to fight this battle. Anything related to, and I own a couple other businesses, so there may be other things that I get involved in down there too. But for right now, we're going to focus on anything related to cosmetology. I'll I'll put one more bug in people's ear um, as we're wrapping my part up anyhow. Um, I come from humble backgrounds. I come from, a. I, I jokingly refer to myself as a farm boy from Iowa because I grew up on a very humble farm. Dad worked in a factory while I was at a very young age, trying to do a man's work on the farm. And I celebrate that because I learned so much about it. But the fact is, I understand people that don't have much in life because I've been there. And so our stylists are near and dear to us, single moms with three kids struggling to make ends meet. We we feel their pain. We do everything we can to help them. I won't go into all the details of what we do, but it's it's literally more than almost anybody else does. So when one of them posts a picture on our closed group Facebook page of them standing in front of a new home that they bought themselves as a single mom. And it's the first home their family's owned in three or four generations because they come from poverty. And they call us out and say, because we work for you and you trained us how to do a better job and you take good care of us, we're able to move our kids into a new to us used home, you know, whatever, uh, that we could never have done if it weren't for you and your company and your family. That gets me up in the morning. That keeps me going. All the rest of it's ancillary. Business is business. It'll do its thing. But anything we can do to help change those lives, we're going to continue to do. So this is only one step. Yeah, what a great, what a great story. What a great example. And that's really what it's, what it's about. I mean, you're giving back to your community. You're creating these jobs. And and how many people out there are you know able to put food on the table for their kids, able to have that that new home because they're employed and because of the, the, the blood, sweat and tears that you've put into your, your business through the years. Uh, Sam, any thoughts on what you all might get involved in? Again, I think it's all about our staff. It's all about our people. So the things that they need our help with are the things that we're going to focus on. Um, that's the stuff we're passionate about. They're the ones that keep us going. And, um, if we can help them, however we can, we will. So I think dad really, he said it all. Look at that. He did. He did. Look, And I knew you would end just, just as close and wonderful of a family as when you started the interview. I knew that was going to happen, right? Um, <laughs> you guys are great. I, I really Thanks, enjoyed dude. it. What a great American story. I mean, just, just, a, a, you should be very proud. I know that you are both of your success, but that of your children and, uh, and of your business. So, so thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Jim. Great. You bet. See, this is one of the things we talk about on this podcast all the time. These barriers that government, you know, and it's well-intentioned. They they want to help people. They want to make sure that people are protected, that the marketplace is protected, all those things. But over time, it grows and it it becomes a barrier that people have to overcome. And, you know, if you look at this story of Jerry and Sam who, who created the barriers here and who created the opportunity? The barrier creator was the government, the state of Iowa, and they created these barriers to success and to economic opportunity for these families that are, that are all across Iowa and Nebraska. But who created the opportunity for them? And it was Jerry and it was Sam and it was the business that they did. So that's the message of this episode of the podcast. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate you. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Watch this episode and others on our YouTube channel at American Potential Podcast. You can find us on the website at AmericanPotential.com. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for listening to American Potential. You may listen to more stories from Americans working every day to expand freedom and opportunity in their communities by visiting AmericanPotential.com.